Hello lovely people. My name is Alethea Thomas. Welcome back to my channel. If you haven't been here before, I primarily do vlogs and booktube content. So if that's what you're here for, you're in the right place. Today um, we are going to be talking about Jane Eyre, a um, very old novel by Charlotte Bronte. Um, before I get into that though, uh, if you are interested in classics, or a list of classics that you could read and just kind of discover um, a wonderful world of classics out there. I have that below in the description, the list that I got from the Yale courses. You can also follow me on Goodreads, um, goodreads.com slash Alethea Thomas. That's also in the description below. I'm just kind of doing this whole classic series as an opportunity to kind of broaden my horizons in reading books. I never really read a lot of classics up until this point, And so I just kind of wanted to become a a bit more well read and so this is what this adventure is about. So I'm actually very very excited today because I get to talk to you about Jane Eyre. Let me kind of uh, give you the, the backstory about how we've gotten here. So I've been reading some other classics. I have read Charles Dickens. I have uh, Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. I have read The Wind in the Willows and I have read Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Um, then I'm also working on Bram Stoker's Dracula currently. And while I was reading Bram Stoker's Dracula, we needed to go on a trip. And we took a trip and we went to Las Vegas, Nevada, and we had a really, really good time. If you have not been to Las Vegas, Nevada, I totally suggest you go because they honestly have everything for everybody there. There was even a bookstore that was full of vintage and antique books that you could purchase. They were very expensive books, but um, I will try to put in some photographs of the bookstore here, just anything, there's things I found online about it. I did not actually go in the store, unfortunately. We were very, very busy and running around a lot, but I saw it, and I saw a couple of the books that they had in the windows, and I was just, I was amazed because, hey, they have everything in Vegas. But um, I did get to go see a couple of different things, though. We wandered around the malls a lot. We went to see Caesar's Palace. We went to see the Venetian. Um, we went to see just kind of all kinds of things. And mostly this was just for my birthday weekend. Uh, I just wanted to purchase some things for myself um, that, you know, really, but I didn't really find much, which is unfortunate. I thought that maybe some of these luxury boutiques would have something I just could not live without. I did find a pair of earrings that I decided to purchase, but they were not very expensive and they were by Givenchy. Um, you know, actually I'll go and get those right now. I'm back. Uh, so these are the earrings by Givenchy. By Givenchy. And I love them. I think they're so pretty. They're actually not very expensive at all because they're just, you know, crystal earrings. Um, not gold or anything, but I do think they add a bit of sparkle. They're very fun. So anyway, what does Jane Eyre have anything to do with going to Las Vegas? I needed a book to listen to <laughs> while I was on the plane. And so I decided to think about, oh, you know, what, what books would I actually like to listen to while I'm on the airplane? And Jane Eyre was one that had kind of come up um, in my sphere just kind of looking around for interesting books to read and it had been described as a gothic romance type novel and it was really good and so I was like all right let's give Charlotte Bronte a go here and try it out so I started listening to it I had to drop Dracula I'm, I'm like midway through Dracula. I'm almost I'm almost done with Dracula right now, but at the time I was midway through Dracula. I had to drop Dracula because Jane Eyre captured me so quickly. Oh my gosh. This is like the month of books that I cannot put down. It is incredible. So um, I picked up listening to Jane Eyre and basically we were listening to the beginning of it um, and her childhood 
and it just it it snagged me and it hooked me and I had to listen to the rest of it. It was just so outstandingly beautiful. So today what we're going to talk about is my review of Jane Eyre. Um, so we're going to start out talking about some background on the book itself. So an introduction to the book, kind of the background behind the book. We are going to talk about the characters, um, the plot. I was going to do a no spoilers plot synopsis, but I can't talk about Jane Eyre without talking about the spoilers. So this is going to be spoiler heavy. If you have not read Jane Eyre and you are interested in reading Jane Eyre and you don't want it spoiled, leave now because I am going to talk about the major plot points and the things that have actually that actually happened so I will be talking about spoilers. I am so sorry. That's just the way it is. I can't avoid the spoilers. Um, and then I'm going to be talking about my thoughts on the book itself. So that being said, why don't we go ahead and get into this and we'll start off with the introduction. So Charlotte Bronte she was the eldest of the three Bronte sisters, and she lived from 1816 to 1855. She was 38 when she died, so fairly young, I think, for the time. 38, I think most people lived into their 50s, if I'm not mistaken, but still fairly young when she died. Um, she was school educated, and she became a governess to her sisters after she graduated. Um, she did marry, and she did try to have a family, but she died due to complications of tuberculosis and pregnancy. Everybody in Victorian England, I think, caught tuberculosis and either died or almost died. It's pretty terrible. So she first wrote under a male pseudonym, and the pseudonym was Courier Bell. But after a lot of speculation, after uh, Jane Eyre was published, she, had, she eventually admitted to writing her own works. The first book that she tried to publish was entitled The Professor, but it was not accepted. When she submitted Jane Eyre in 1847, it was published within six weeks of her turning it in, and it was actually published on October 16th, which is the day after my birthday. It was serendipitous that it's October, it's Halloween, this book is gothic-y, it's a gothic romance, it was published in October, I read it in October, and it was the day after my birthday that it was published. It's just, it all goes together. It's all in sync and serendipitous and just, just funny how it all turns out. Just hilarious. So almost immediately after publication, the book was considered highly controversial. It attracted many readers and it was praised for its originality and freedom of expression. You know, this was Victorian England, so this book was very passionate and very expressive for its time. But it was also a really well-written novel. The sentences are clear and concise, but they're still romantic. They're not like flowery and running on and on and on. It's, it's a very well-written text. Negative criticism around the novel primarily came from conservative and religious people. Claims were made that the novel deviated from social norms, was too passionate, immoral, anti-authoritative, and anti-religious, as in it was anti-Christian. The novel's admirers and critics, though, praised the work for its realism and Bronte's narrative power. The novel was considered remarkable and spellbinding because of Jane's freedom of expression. So that's kind of the backdrop. Characters. So there, there's a really large cast of characters in this book, and I'm just going to go over a, a few very quickly. You know, the, these are kind of the really important ones that are in Jane's orbit. A lot of the other characters are kind of backdrop characters. They do add in to, to the story, but they're more like backdrop characters. So Jane Eyre herself, she's our protagonist. The, the book follows Jane through her life from childhood into early adulthood. Everything is told in first person perspective. So take that in mind. Mrs. Reed and her children. Mrs. Reed is Jane's aunt. She promises her husband to take care of Jane because her husband was Jane's uncle and Jane's parents both died. However, Mrs. Reed kind of 
ignores her, doesn't want to acknowledge Jane's existence, hates dealing with Jane, and eventually ends up sending Jane to a boarding school. Her children, John and the two girls, and I can't remember the two girls' names off the top of my head, they are kind of mean to her, especially John Reed. He's very cruel to Jane and beats her up a little bit. The Reed family is not very nice to Jane and they end up sending her away. Bessie is the governess for Mrs. Reed and Bessie is the first person who is really kind to Jane, but Bessie still keeps a kind of distance from Jane because she is employed by Mrs. Reed and doesn't want to make Mrs. Reed upset with her, I think, in caring too much for Jane. She kind of does what she can and then just leaves things as they are. Mr. Brocklehurst is probably the next character that is against Jane. He and Mrs. Reed kind of see eye to eye on thinking that Jane is, is kind of a wicked child, is asks too many questions, is difficult to deal with, she's just not a good child, which is far from the truth. And Mr. Brocklehurst runs the school where Jane ends up going to school. He is, um, I think he's a parish minister, perhaps. He keeps the school in squalor while his own family is very wealthy. So Mr. Brocklehurst is a hypocrite, basically, having this luxurious lifestyle while keeping the school in just absolutely squalorous conditions and ends up, you know, there there is a big inquiry that goes into the school in, in the early parts of the book, and Mr. Brocklehurst, I think, ends up not being punished, but being reined in, um, and, and he quits stealing from the school. Maria Temple is the first teacher that Jane has that is very kind to her and shows her nothing but kindness. She kind of puts Jane on the path of becoming a teacher herself and uh, realizing her own potential. So she is a really positive influence on Jane's life. Edward Rochester, he is Jane's love interest. He is the man that she falls in love with. Mr. Rochester owns Thornfield Hall, which Jane ends up going to, to be his governess for his ward. Adele Varens is the little child that Mr. Uh, Rochester has adopted as his ward and so Jane comes to be the governess for Adele. Adele is a little French girl and she is just adorable throughout the entire book. John Rivers and his sisters, they are very important at the end of the book. You kind of find out that John and his, John's a very evangelical man. He and his sisters take Jane in and take care of her at the end of the book and help her through her, prob her troubles at the end and kind of help lead her on her way um, toward the end of the book. So let's go over the plot really quickly. The novel is told from the first person perspective of Jane Eyre, an orphan girl who is abandoned by her relations and is forced to go to an impoverished school called Lowood. After attending, really surviving, the school, she teaches for a few years. She then becomes a governess for Mr. Rochester at Thornfield Hall, and she's the governess for a little French girl named Adele. Mr. Rochester took her in, took Adele in as his ward. A few months pass, and Jane and Mr. Rochester fall in love. On the day of Jane's wedding to Mr. Rochester, Jane discovers that Mr. Rochester has many secrets. The most important secret being that he has a wife locked up in his attic. And so we find out 15 years prior that he had been tricked into marrying a woman who was mad. So Jane ends up wrestling with this revelation and decides to leave Thornfield while everyone is asleep. She travels into the countryside. She's kind of lost in her own internal turmoil. She, she's wandering around, I think, for three days. She ends up at the home of a parish minister and his sisters. After they talk to Jane and live with her for several weeks, it turns out that they are her distant relations. Jane ends up inheriting a small fortune from an uncle, and she shares her luck with her new relations. The minister, John Rivers, who's her cousin, asks Jane to marry him and to join him on a mission to India, but she refuses and hears 
a voice crying her name. And she just knows. She knows that it's Mr. Rochester and that she needs to go and find him and see him before she decides what to do about perhaps going to India and, and marrying someone else. She returns to Thornfield Hall and discovers that it's burned down. Edward Rochester had tried to save his mad wife, but she is conveniently dead and he survived. But he is injured and is now blind and is he's crippled. I think his right hand is crippled. She sees him again and loves him despite his injuries. And they decide to marry. And then they live happily ever after. So that's, you know, the short plot of the book. Real short. I mean, it skims over everything. It doesn't cover half of the stuff that's actually in the book. That's just the kind of the main line of the story. So what my thoughts are on the book and why in the world did I love it so much. It's such a passionate text. I don't think I have read something that is so clearly spoken and so passionate at the same time. It was very enjoyable to read. It's almost modern in its language, which was just the craziest thing to me if you ask me, because I fully expected when I started listening to it that it was going to be very flowery, very old English style, you know, nothing that I could really sit down and just read. But the second that I started listening to it on the audiobook, I was like, I've got to get this in print form and I need to see it and I need to start highlighting text just in case there's something absolutely wonderful. And there are so many wonderful passages in this book. Like I said, the writing is just incredible. The descriptions are incredible. It's magical. This book embodies the magic of England. I've heard it said before that just England has a magic to it and this book completely embodies the magic of England. There's almost a, f a fairy tale aspect to this book, but it's very realistic in its telling. Religion is kind of used as a vehicle for magic in this book where Jane will, you know, like she hears a voice and she thinks that, oh, God is instructing her to, you know, to follow this, to heed this. She does balk a lot at actual practitioners of religion, though, and kind of go against what they want. Um, this is at least twice in the book, first with Mr. Brocklehurst and then with John, her cousin, who, who wants to take her to India to be a missionary. But she really doesn't want to be like a missionary's wife. It's not really her calling. But he knows that she's so intelligent and such a, a good worker that basically he could no, he could work her to death going to India and not feel bad about it. <laughs> but she doesn't want to do that. And she knows in her heart she doesn't want to do it. And so then she, she hears the voice of, um, of the person that she actually loves, Mr. Rochester. Um, the romance in this book is just wonderful. You know, you can keep your Darcy. Take a Mr. Rochester any day of the week. Oh. And, you know, Jane and Mr. Rochester are not described as very attractive people, to be perfectly honest. They are fairly plain. Mr. Rochester is, you know, an older man, and he's kind of described as a bit of an ogre in a way, and he's real gruff, and um, he likes to poke fun at people in conversation. He really likes to ruffle Jane's feathers when their dialogue is going back and forth in the book. And I think that's what really got me is like, I just love this back and forth actual banter between two people of the same, you know, mind and of the same um, education. And it, I mean, it's fascinating to, to read this, so. Anyway, listening to the book, I ended up getting the actual text on my Kindle um, from the library system. So if nothing else, if, if you want an actual owned copy for yourself, you can get it on Kindle really cheaply too. It's like $2, I think, through Amazon. 
and um, through the, of course through the library system is totally free. I do think that maybe for Christmas I'm going to get myself a copy of the, uh, not a copy, but a collection of the Bronte sisters, and I think I might get the English, the Penguin English Library editions um, of that, because they have a nice little box set for about $50, uh, and they're the, the cloth bound ones, which look really pretty on shelves. So I think that's what I'm going to do. But, you know, the this book, the romance, the writing, it was like reading a movie. Me reading the text and listening to it as well was like watching a movie in my brain. I don't think I've ever really experienced that with a book too much, maybe a little bit, but through this entire book, it was like that. Um, from the beginning where Jane was a little girl, I don't think there's a person on the planet who could not empathize, sympathize with Jane and, you know, her childhood, my, my childhood was very similar in some ways. I think a lot of people can find a similarity there. She enjoyed reading, she enjoyed her loneliness you know, being by herself, trying to hide away in the house in a little corner, a little nook somewhere to get away from her relations that she didn't like. And then being sent to school and, you know, making friends and finding, finding adults that would actually help her instead of try to hinder her and her struggles, you know, getting to the point where she was done with going to school and kind of moving on with her life and then going to Thornfield, making all those decisions herself to actually move on from where she was and advertise herself, go to Thornfield, start working for her employer. As soon as Jane is able to start making decisions for herself, she really takes a hold of that and she has her independence and she tries to figure out a path for herself going, you know, for her own life. Um, she does meet Mr. Rochester, and she, over time, she does fall in love with him. I think that their romance is just very cute, um, very sweet, and I, I just loved reading their banter, like I said. Um, he calls her his fairy all the time because she's just kind of this creature of, she likes to go on these evening walks in the moonlight and things like that, and um, and it's just kind of, he thinks that there is like a magic about her that he has never experienced with other women before. And he's just so cute when he tells her that stuff. You then find out about his past, which has been kind of tragic in a way. Um, <laughs> and I guess from what I understand, back in Victorian England, if people were crazy, they either went to an insane asylum or they were kept at home under wraps practically, you know, chained up in their own, not maybe chained up, but, but locked in their own rooms and their houses and not really allowed to go out into the light of day. This was his unfortunate secret was that he had been married and he was trying to justify himself, which I don't know if he's justified at all, and this to be perfectly honest. I mean, this is, this is Victorian England we're talking about, so it is what it is. He married a woman he didn't know very well. He didn't really know her as well as he should have. His father was trying to have him marry her for money. Mr. Rochester was actually the second son of his father, but his father and his brother both passed away, and he ended up inheriting Thornfield Hall after all. So he marries um, this woman. He doesn't know that she's crazy. After trying to live with her for four years and dealing with her insanity, her anger, all, all of this stuff that he explains in the book, he decides that he cannot handle it anymore and so he basically has her locked up in the house and he travels a lot to try and forget about his, his woes and his horrible, you know, trying to deal with her. Well then he comes back and he's got, you know, Jane as a governess to his ward and he meets Jane, he loves Jane and you know, he decides, okay, well, perhaps I can keep my former wife a secret, you know, and I can marry Jane legally because nobody really knows that my wife is still alive. 
Um, it's been so long now, maybe they can presume that she's dead. Well, that wasn't the case. Um, there were folks that showed up at the wedding, actually. During, during the wedding, um, th there was an objection, and documentation is produced that proves that the wife is alive and that she's living in Thornfield Hall. So all of this is actually a horrible shock to Jane because she has no idea what's going on. Uh, she had suspected something odd was going on at Thornfield Hall itself, but she had no idea it was, you know, someone living in the attic. She thought it was a ghost. So that's kind of the gothic, part of the gothic elements of this mystery in Thornfield Hall, is that, oh, is there a ghost in Thornfield Hall because all this mysterious, all these mysterious things keep happening, a uh, fire happens, Jane hears this noise, like somebody laughing at times. She has a dream where a person came into her room and tore her wedding veil up. Well, then she wakes up and finds the wedding veil torn up. So that kind of thing has happened too. So Jane doesn't know anything about the wife. She ends up finding out all of this stuff and has a hard time dealing with it, which frankly, I would never blame her, to be honest. It's... It was like, wow, I, I think that when I read that part and we found out that he has a wife, ah, I, I just about died because I was just so emotionally invested at that point in them being together. I was like, no, 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 you can't do this, Charlotte Bronte. You can't take them away from each other. It's not fair. So Jane has a hard time dealing with it. And what she ends up doing is uh, walking out of Thornfield Hall without anything. She takes like a small uh, amount of stuff with her when she leaves, but she ends up leaving it behind on a coach because she's just so distraught and she's just out of her mind. She ends up wandering around the countryside for about three days and sleeps outside. She can't find anything to eat. She begs a little bit and then she eventually goes to this minister's house uh, for, for the parish the woman who's at the house tells her that the, the parishioner is not there and that he is not to return for some time. So then Jane wanders away again, but then she ends up finding him and also his sisters at a house that she approaches and she knocks on the door and asks if, if she could have some help. They do help her. Um, the housekeeper is very suspicious of Jane at first and kind of doesn't want to let her in, but um, the people that lived at the house, uh, John and his two sisters, they decide that, oh, please, please come in. We will take care of you. And so they end up taking care of Jane for a little while. Jane does recover with them. She lives with them for a while. And then they find out that they're all related. And Jane has an uncle who is going to be leaving her a fortune. Um, actually, the uncle came up, like, kind of before we find out that she's related to the rest of these people. But she ends up, she does have relations. She had been told, like, her entire life that she had no other relations besides her aunt, who had kicked her out of their house, sent her away to that impoverished school, and didn't want anything to do with her ever again. They help her, she helps them too, um, once she finds out she's inheriting all of this wealth. And she splits it up evenly between the four of them. And then at that point, John, the parish minister, which I just, I disliked. All, <laughs> all of the representations of Christianity in this book were just awful. They were awful people, they were vicious, horrible in some ways, and just greedy, just greedy people. And maybe that was the, the purpose of that. That authoritative religion is not necessarily the best way to go. I don't know, that's just kind of what I, I drew from that. I don't know if that was Charlotte Bronte's message specifically, but you know, that authoritative religion. But to kind of trust in your own guiding star in your own values because I guess innately Jane is a good person and she could follow her own path and still be kind of right with with religious aspects if you will so then John tries to get her to marry him and he does this in the most awful way possible 
he tries to convince her that this is God's message to him, that he must marry Jane and that she must come with him to help him in his mission because that is what God wants. And if she doesn't, then she's going to hell. <sighs> I've heard about this sort of thing happening to women before and I just cannot believe, believe what I hear since I still cannot believe it. Even, even from this book written during its time, I can't. I don't believe it. It's just ridiculous. Um, so, ladies, if you're ever approached by a man that told you that God told him that you have to marry, just don't do it. Do not do it. She does return to Mr. Rochester because she hears this voice because when John tries to get her to marry him, I think it's just too much for her. She has kind of a... <laughs> mental thing going on and she swears that she hears a voice and the voice of God is telling her Jane Jane return to Mr. Rochester so she then decides to return to Mr. Rochester and then she finds out what happened to him which was terrible um, his wife died she actually started the fire because she tried to she lit the fire previous to, so she, you know, catches the whole house on fire, the whole house burns down. Edward Rochester tries to save her and doesn't end up saving her. But conveniently, she's dead. Hey, she's dead. And uh, Jane is then free to marry Mr. Rochester. And they have a nice little kind of banter back and forth at the end of the book um, before, you know, they decide, yes, let's, let's go ahead, let's do this, let's get married. And then, you know, like all things, they live happily ever after. But I think that the feminist aspects of Jane Eyre are very strong. She is doing things for herself and not because some man is telling her to do it. Um, not because God is telling her to do it. She is listening to her own intuition, her own voice. So I think that for the time, that is extremely, extremely feminist. See if I've got any other notes on this I want to share. But if you are looking for a classic to pick up and read and to really enjoy, I think that this is one of the best books I have ever read. I did not want to put it down. And I just, page after page, I mean, it's a, it's a fairly long book. So the original publication, I think, is about 592 pages. So it's not a short book by any means, but it is a very good book. So I suggest anybody pick it up and read it. I think that's about it. So I, I hope you enjoyed the review. I so enjoyed the book. It was just so fantastic. And just please pick it up. Please read it. Yeah, so my October is going extremely well. I should be finishing up Dracula here in the next day or so. I have unfortunately been a little bit busy with actual work and children. A bit so I've only really gotten through about three books this month but as soon as I'm done with Dracula I will put up a review up for that I want to do one by the 31st for sure for Dracula and then I think I'll pick up a wild sheep chase as soon as I as soon as I put down Dracula so anyway thank you so much for joining me I hope you enjoyed and we'll see you soon bye